I'm Maddie Sloan and welcome to Snap Happy, the photography show. In today's episode, we conclude our adventures through Tasmania. Darren Lill explores the sand dunes of Nambung National Park in Western Australia. And Peter Eastway brings us another brilliant tip for improving our post-production skills. But first, we meet a young dynamic photographer who's racked up an incredible amount of experience in his relatively short time behind the lens. His photographic style is as diverse as the locations he's traveled through. Let's go meet him. Fraser, welcome to Snap Happy. Where did your love of photography come from? So I think my dad was a big influence on in my photography. My dad started photo tours back in the 80s and now I'm joining him with World Photo Adventures as a trainee. So I get to go to some amazing places which many people only dream of. So Fraser, how would you describe your style? My style is still evolving I think, but I get lots of opportunities from landscapes, people, culture, that nature and wildlife is, is my forefront at the moment. I just love birds in flight and can't get enough of that at the moment. So you've travelled to some amazing locations. Any standouts? In Alaska, in Alaska wilderness, we had some of the best bear experiences. Two young bears were fishing for about two hours, catching nothing, and uh, one came out with this big dog salmon, and it was a feature shot for amazing. me. Amazing. Yeah. Africa would be incredible to photograph. Tell me about it. Namibia stands out. We had Sausage Flay Dunes. At Tosha National Park, we had some of the best wildlife. You know, big five cats, we had lions, cheetahs, Everything. leopards, some of the best birds. So when I think of Africa, I think of the animals. But obviously, you're getting some amazing images of the cultural diversity and the beautiful people there as well. So yeah, visiting the Himba people, we got to visit the local tribe there. They got the mud huts and they, they bathe themselves in, in mud. Just being with them when they're doing their daily things like cooking and that, it's pretty awesome. So you've recently been to India as well. So we're doing a family trip, just scouting out some locations for a future tour. We did a Ganges cruise amazing. and um, that was great fun and a few local villages as well. So we've got some amazing architecture in the temples. Just the clothing of the ladies is, is really out there and really cool. The diversity of India is really outstanding. Can't wait to go back. So Fraser, tell us, what are some of your favourite subjects to shoot here in Australia? So I love my wildlife photography, birds in flight. So just before Patagonia, I was out in my backyard shooting ospreys. And that's just great fun. In one day, you know, I got a collection of images of ospreys with food, with, with fish. And, you know, can't go wrong with that. Let's have a chat about landscape imagery here in Australia. I find that people want to travel to find a beautiful landscape, but we're so blessed with our own backyard. That's it, like on the Great Barrier Reef, Lady Elliot, right on our doorstep. We got Karajini, some of the best canyons in the world. Over the years, Fraser Island I've visited many times. From a baby, you know. Is that where your name's from? I would assume so. That's where my name's <laughs> from, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I feel proud to be named after Fraser, so it's pretty cool. Beautiful place. Yeah, it is. <laughs> You're a Sony digital advocate. What is it about the Sony system that you love? Well, just the overall quality is outstanding. Uh, I like how it handles. In the new A7R 3 and A7R 4 the high resolution of the, these new cameras is pretty awesome. You know, you can print wall size and not have to worry, you know, with quality. Just the dynamic range, 15 stops of dynamic range is outstanding. A lot to work with, with raw images. So I had a sneak in your kit before yep. and you had three lenses in there. Tell yep. me about them. So I got the 100 to 400, so that's my go for for all the wildlife action. I got the 16 to 35, that's like my go for for landscapes. I got my 24 to 105, which is like my kit lens for general purpose work going from portraits to, to still get the 24mm for the wide angle. And you've got some filters in there as well. I use Nissi filters, so I've got the V5 kit there for all my landscapes, so strap it on to my 16 to 35. How does Sony differ from the other systems that you've used? The ability to to up my ISO to, to you know, 6400 ISO, I wouldn't have been able to do that in my previous camera, you know. I love the flip screen on the Sony mirrorless systems. With the A7R4 out, you know, with the 61 megapixel sensor, the ability to crop is just, you can't go wrong, and still print big. Fraser, the world is your oyster. Where to next? So we've got tours into 2021, but in between that, I just bought my own four-wheel drive and I plan to do some own personal photo trips as well. Beautiful. Looking forward to seeing some images. Stick around, guys, because coming up, we're heading out on the road with Fraser to see him in action and get some great tips. As part of Ultimate Creative Week, we've come to one of our key targets, which is the sand dunes in Nambung National Park. I rate these sand dunes as some of the prettiest in the world. The sand is very white, beautiful ripples, 
and our group is out there exploring at the moment and I can't stop them. They're literally starting to spread out and explore and be creative. It's such a cool place. There's a little bit of effort climbing up that first sand dune, but then we're sort of on the crests of these waves that just move exceptionally slowly. And you can actually see them reforming you know, with a slight breeze or a little bit of a wind. You can see the sand coming off the top. It has to be one of my favourite things to photograph. The dunes are really unusual because they, um, a bit like the pinnacles, seem to just be in the middle of nowhere as well. So you'll have these grassy scrub and then these really striking dunes, this beautiful white sand, really interesting to explore for photographers. You know, I've travelled overseas to get to really good sand dunes in the Middle East and in Death Valley in the USA, and they're just two hours north of Perth. Amazing. So this morning, we've got a lot of fantastic photo opportunities. And what we like to try and do is utilize foreground. So here, we've got beautiful ripples in the foregrounds, leading onto a, a line with the snaking dunes, leading into the background with a lovely big dune in the background there. So we're actually finding 400 ISO, 200 ISO is not bad either, F11, 24 millimeter focal length, but even a bit wider works. We're purposely tilting the camera a little bit to emphasize the foreground. By doing that, you create a more dimensional look to your final result. Something you can do in these type of environments is use different perspectives. So throughout this morning's shoot, I've been using everything from my 8 to 18 millimetre lens to a 24 to 120 millimetre lens and I had a longer telephoto out. It gives a real mix of results and a diversity of what you can offer to put in a book or something of that nature. Another tip for you is to consider perspective. I love to add people into a scene. Now, in the old days, traditionally, editors of magazines weren't so keen on that, and they wanted real wild, natural-looking environments. But today, a lot of editors love to have a person in there. And as a photographer, I like to add a person in to give a sense of scale and perspective to the result. A lovely brisk morning has offered a unique shoot. So we got up early, in the dark, and we set up our tripods and waited a little while. And the sun came up slowly and we could see the red rolling clouds of colour coming through to us. And eventually we we're at this headland of a sand dune and perfectly the light just lit up for us, really pretty. So it's again one of those occasions where we waited, we were patient, we were set up correctly, right settings, beautiful photographs. We're driving along a quiet stretch of road. I'm keeping my voice down because we've come across an echidna. Echidnas don't like sharp noises, so we're very quiet, being patient, and very simple technique. So we're using a longer telephoto lens, so we're not too close to the animal, and then we're using aperture priority F8 or F11, little bit of depth of field, not too much, but everyone's getting very low at the animal's level. They're an absolute iconic Australian animal, and the imagery that we'll get it should be fantastic. Just a tip when you're doing nature in the wild is to minimise your interaction with the animal as much as possible. Remember, the animal is wild and it needs its space as well. So we're using long telephoto lenses to allow that. We don't want to upset the animal. Get some photographs, enjoy the moment, move on. Another Australian icon is the grass tree. I love grass trees. I've got some at home myself. And photographically, I always find them quite a challenge. They're busy messy sometimes, but you can get some really pretty photographs. And I've never seen so many grass trees before in one given space. So in this case, I've asked everyone to use super wide angle lenses. Vary the aperture, you might shoot F4, you might shoot F11, but you're trying to find a plant that you can isolate that's different to the rest of the plants. There's big clumps of these grass trees. Some are as high as five meters high. If you can isolate a subject, your viewer will enjoy the photograph often much more than a busy, messy scene. So often I think when we go out and take photos, you might do it sporadically. You go out for a morning, you know, once a month and do it. But when you've got a week where, you, where all your attention is focused on producing some new work, you find you're so creative and so productive. And as soon as you're standing next to somebody who's also photographing the same scene, and then you see what they captured and you see what you captured, you went, wow, I didn't actually see that and I was standing next to you. The skill development moves incredibly quickly. 
Bruni Island is a great location for capturing nature, but one of the other highlights here is the amazing food. Phil Kiravita is a Tasmanian photographer that's produced some amazing books focused on the culinary delights found in the region. Phil, what do you love about Tassie? It's a wonderful place to, to live, to, to bring up children, to take pictures, to find passionate people that are into food and wine. It's got everything that, that I'm looking for and my books are a way of celebrating that. And how would you describe your photographic genre? I was trained as a commercial photographer so when we first came here we were doing a lot of corporate industrial type work. We went into black and white portraits, a, a good 20 years of weddings and I've retired from that now. We do all sorts of things. So you've just released your second book about food in Tassie. Tell us about that. Eat, Drink, Love Tasmania 2 is the second one in that series, but we've done 10 books now. Um, most of them are of food of some sort. I look at it as a, a field guide for an amazing trip around Tasmania. If you can do half of the things that are in the book, you will have had a great trip here. Can you share some tips with us about how you produce your books? We do it all in-house. So my wife is the designer, so we can take the book right from the development stage through the printing. So let me show you how we've put together a double page spread in the book. So we're here at Bruni Island Premium Wines. They've been in a couple of my books now, and so this is a good place to show you how we go about uh, doing a food shoot for the book. I use the, the Fuji X-T3, and because my work is so diverse, I need a kit that allows me to take the equipment that I need without having to be loaded down. So my setup for, for this, I've got one of these, uh, these small little lights that, that's lightweight, it will, it'll travel in my bag. I use a couple of wine glasses in front of it just to break the light up a little bit so it's not a direct light but it's dappled light. I've got a tiny little torch which sometimes I'll use as a, as a backlight um, just to put a little highlight in, into the background. Another very easy bit of kit is a, a foil reflector. With the burger we, we need to get the light underneath the bun and, and create some really nice sort of highlights on the, the patty and on the bacon and uh, a little bit of shine off the cheese. So now that we're set up and ready to go, we'll go into the kitchen and we'll have a, a chat to the chef. What we're looking for there is to get some, some shots of him in action, putting the meal together. And all of those things will tie in together as little, little pictures on the double page spread, which helps tell the story of what we're doing here. Now that we've got the burger, it's really important to shoot it as quickly as possible because fresh food tends to sag as soon as you start trying to mess around with it. And now it's just a matter of trying to get the light looking interesting, trying to get some reflections on the meat and on the, the relish, and making sure that the background's nice and soft. Excellent. Once you've shot it the way you think it's going to look, it's important to pull back a little bit so that there's space for text and for the recipe and all, all of that. So I, I think this looks good. We'll combine it with some of the pictures um, that we take around the vineyard and of the, of the chef doing his magic. And uh, it, it'll turn out as a, a really nice double page spread in the book. We had a 6k trek this morning to get up here bright and early to Mount Fitzroy with this waterfall. There can be a lot of people here at this location, so it's good to get up early. I chose here because I've got the waterfall in the foreground, I've got the fall colours in the mid-range and then I've got the mountains up top. I'm just waiting for light changes as, as the sun's coming up now. I'm using the Sony A7R3, a 16 to 35, 2.8 wide angle. I've hooked up the Nissi filter system here with the three stop ND. Shooting F11, 100 ISO. Trying to just slow down the water a little bit, like three to four seconds, not too much. With the Sony mirrorless systems here, I'm using the live viewfinder. What you see is what you're gonna get. So particularly when you're shooting landscapes, it just makes it much easier. We're just starting to get some colour on the mountains now. So I'm shooting now F11, 100 ISO and getting about a three second exposure. It's coming up really well. Mm -hmm. 
now that most of the people have moved on, we've moved up the falls a bit, trying to just get some alternative shots. Here I shot F22, closed my aperture. Sony features a 50 ISO, natively 100, but 50 ISO here. And that's giving about a half a second exposure. Really getting the four colours here. As we walk up the creek, there's just so much colour here. The colours here in autumn are just beautiful. You've got the phagus trees here. I'm isolating the four colours with the mountain and the creeks. There's just so many photo opportunities here. We didn't get the colour in the sky we were hoping for today, but we've still got a full waterfall, still got the four colours. You can't always expect to have the perfect light, but you can't complain. It's, it's a beautiful scene as it is. Remember, your photography doesn't have to be complicated. Keep it simple, and I hope these tips have helped you. One of the things I love about photography is the ability to use a long shutter speed to blur motion. So a classic example is a waterfall or a running creek and we've got a little bit of rain here in Middlehurst and it's really running quickly now. So what shutter speeds do you want? Normally a quarter of a second to one second, maybe even longer. As a quick technique, what I suggest you do on your camera is set it to aperture priority. Add a neutral density filter. The neutral density filter slows down the amount of light that reaches the sensor, giving you a slow shutter speed. Then select your wide aperture, say f4, take a photograph. Go down to f5.6, take another. So you'll take a series of photographs going down to your smallest aperture of f16 or f22, and that's when the shutter speed gets very, very long and the water really, really blurred. Back to the homestead, let's open these up and I'm going to show you how we can really get that water to sing and to sparkle. So we're back down the hill and I'm here tucked away with my Wacom Mobile Studio Pro and I have Adobe Lightroom open. But I promised to show you how a long shutter speed can create some wonderful effects with moving water. Let's have a look. The first thing I'd like to do in Lightroom is to just adjust the horizon. It looks as though the water is going up a little bit over here on the right so let's just change that. And I can just tilt the image a little bit to the right and now the water is falling down. And that gives me, I think, a superior crop. Next, I want to bring out the background. I love the colours in that background. That's easily done. I'm just going to grab the saturation slider and move that to the right. And you can see it does all sorts of wonderful things to that background. In fact, we could go a little bit further than that. I'm not fussed about getting right up on the right-hand side there. However, the water is now a little bit brown. So we need to perhaps change that. Let's give it a, a little bit of blue. I'm going to grab my adjustment brush. And I'm using the adjustment brush because I only want to change the water, not the whole image. And I'm just going to paint it in. And you can see there where I've darkened the image down. Let's just go and zero that out because we're not actually wanting to darken the image. All we're really wanting to do is change the colour to blue. So I'm grabbing my temp slider and I'm moving that to the left. You can see the blue water coming in there. And then I shall continue to paint it in. So as you can see, that's completely transformed the photograph. But wait, there's more. Let's darken down that bottom left-hand corner of fraction. We'll grab the adjustment brush and we'll paint in bottom left-hand corner. And I'm following the contour of the waves that are already there and maybe a little bit of contrast. And I think that's it. Photography is all about capture and post-production. I'm Peter Eastway. We're here in Western Australia, Nambung National Park. We've been exploring the dunes for the past couple of days and we're heading out to give you some tips and techniques. Let's go. So I've just done a vertical here. I was looking at isolating the foreground and letting the background do the work for me. So I've got a nice foreground with the detail of the ripples and I've got this nice backdrop of dunes as well. Adding details like this is a creative way to tell your story. This scene here has just caught my eye. I'm using the Sony 16-35 2.8 wide angle lens. You've got the ripples in the foreground here leading up to a different pattern of ripples with the sky as your background. It's an interesting image. Now that we've taken a nice image, let's go walk straight through it. <laughs> I 
I've just switched to my telephoto, 100 to 400. And I'm looking here, I just saw six dunes in a row. And I'm looking to compress the scene. What that means is it makes the dunes appear close together. One of my favorite features of the Sony mirrorless systems is its articulating screen. A lot of cameras now offer this feature, but this is an area where Sony really excels in with the quality and accuracy of its screen and its touch screen as well. So it really helps me in a shot like this because I have to get the camera down low to take the shot. With my old system, I always had to line the sand. Sony makes it so much easier. So the third lens I've got in my kit today is a 24 to 105 f4. This is a great all-rounder lens, so 24mm get the scene shot and 105mm I can get the finer details. This lens offers optical steady shot, which gives me the option to shoot at slower shutter speeds. This lens paired with the a7R 3 is a perfect combination. I highly recommend it in your kit. Thanks for joining us on Snap Happy. If you'd like to join our community, head on over to snaphappytv.com. There you'll find exclusive content, competitions and special offers from our partners. See you next time on Snap Happy, the photography show.